we're speaking with Irena Stradivert from Ukraine, from the city of Lvov. She's here at the Penn International Writers' Conference in Bled, Slovenia. She's uh, very graciously given us a few minutes to speak because there's not a lot of people coming out of Ukraine right now to uh, another country in the West to talk about the situation there. So you told me earlier that you had you could not take a flight from Kiev, so you had to take a bus, is that right? Yes, because uh, civil uh, aviation now is just closed because this the uh, our sky is not safe. Right. So you were able to get out of the border. Was there any trouble getting out of the country over the border? No, not at all. You went through Poland and then Went Bulgaria? through Poland. No, it ah. was like through Czechia, Austria, and I'm here in Slovenia. 36 hours. Did you sleep on the bus? Uh, I did the second night. The first night I couldn't sleep on the bus, but the second I was quite exhausted, so I guess I slept. Oh, that's amazing mm -hmm. that you got here. Uh, what is the situation above now? There have been... Uh, what, from, uh, what's happening on the ground is very difficult for me to assess, not being in Ukraine, and both sides telling different stories all the time. So uh, it's very unclear to me, being objective to say, for example, when the ship was sunk, the Russian ship, the Mok uh, Mokfra, the first Ukraine said they sunk it. I said, okay, and then the Russians said they sunk it, so now I knew the ship was sunk. But Ukraine says they hit it with missiles, and Russia says it was an accident. So, so I'm asking you, since you lived there, and you can tell me you're an eyewitness, there have been a few attacks by the Russians of outside the city uh, at military depots, or has it been more than that? Yeah, of course, I didn't been witness the Moscow ship right. thinking, but I live in Lviv, it's the western part of, of Ukraine, and uh, unlike in other parts which were close to the Belarusian border or across the Russian border, we were not approached by Russian soldiers on the ground. We are far away from the front lines now, but yes, I think every second or third day we have at least one air raid at, um, attack alarm, and uh, as far as our um, um, anti-missile uh, defense report, there were 62 uh, air raids uh, on the city of Lviv since the start of the war, and seven missiles were successfully hitting the aims. But these aims were not uh, particularly military. In Lviv, they hit it three uh, sub um, um, electric power station, they hit it railway, and uh, they hit it um, uh, um, petroleum deposit, and uh, um, an STO, the, the place where you repair your cars, how do you call it, service, auto, auto, auto car, right, yeah. auto part yeah. service, okay. yeah. Were any people, civilians killed inside? Uh, we time? have like seven casualties and uh, I believe more than 20 people wounded or mm. injured. I see. Um, but it's little in comparison with what's happening in different sure. parts of Ukraine. It's just a tiny thing. Right. Do you think that it will become a focus of the war, your city? And there's been talk that Poland might be interested in... Uh, regaining their territory. What do you think about that? You know, uh, we have a very entangled history with Poland through many centuries. But uh, I must say that when Ukraine uh, announced its uh, independence after the referendum of 1991, Poland was one of the two first countries to recognize Ukraine in its current borders. And it never changed through the 30 right. years. And I believe now Poles are real, really sisters and brothers because not like him opened their homes, opened their hearts, opened their pockets for Ukrainian refugees. Right. So that's Yeah, it's nonsense. bullshit. That's right. <laughs> All right. So what, uh, from your, your poet, Yes, do you I write am. about politics or what thing do you write about? Well, <laughs> I did not plan to write about politics when I was 16 or 18, just starting my, my, my writing. But uh, I think that the longer I live, the more political I get. And it's hard to be just lyrical in the situation like this. It's an existential situation. But uh, even such a dangerous situation, or probably particularly such situation, um, demand some creativity and demand some articulation. So I think, yes, it's a toll on our as authors to, to have something to speak 
to have something to say on, on the subject, but at the same time, there is a responsibility to say something. And under the conditions that you're living, are you able to write new poems? And what subjects would you be writing Where, about? Uh, for me, this war did not start on February 24th uh, this year because annexation of Crimea has started quite earlier and friends of mine, particularly Crimean Tatars, were fleeing Crimea and they settled within Ukraine and some of my uh, friends from Donetsk and Luhansk fleeing into Ukraine, some other were fleeing into Russia and again they were refugees, like we had uh, more than a million of internal refugees since 2014 already so for many people now it's like a second refuge and uh, all that time I was I was aware that the war is at my doorsteps and uh, probably people tended to live in Ukraine keeping the war somehow at the back of their minds but it never was at the back of my mind so yes I was writing all that time through and I was uh, well, I was trying to understand something to myself. As a scholar, as a cultural studies researcher, I was interested about the historical and cultural memory of catastrophic events of 20th century in my part of the world. So I have been reading intensively about uh, the trauma of war, about the Holocaust, about uh, civilian suffering, about refuge, about deportations, about all kinds of things which happen to people which are in the situation of extreme violence. And now that extreme violence came for me. In February 2014, when did you go to, to the capital during the uprisings that got uh, Maidan? kicked out the Maidan uh, events that kicked out Yanukovych? When it was 2014, I was uh, just coming from the Netherlands where I was spending a previous year and unfortunately I have broken my leg so wow. I was in a special treatment I so I was it was not possible for me individually to come there or to be helpful there but many of my friends students and relatives yes they were there right and do you believe that the departure of Yanukovych was a constitutional change of government well, um, as probably you remember, on February 22, uh, 2014, Yanukovych as a president fled from Ukraine. After that, the elections were called. There was an intermediary government which went on only through May 20-something uh, of that year. And on that day, there were elections all national elections and the first round in the first round of the first of that election Poroshenko was elected a new right. president right. and then there were new elections of the parliament and um, Yanukovych party actually was dissolved but yes. but many of his uh, party colleagues created a new opposition party and they entered into parliament not, not with the majority though. not as yeah. a majority but you have to remember that part of the of their electorate base was already um, distant from Ukraine. Like Cr was Crimea, Crimea was always supporting them right. and Donbass as yeah, well. Yeah, they lost. The party regions lost. Yes, many they votes it dissolved. Yes, but the parliament functioned without these seats. Right. So these seats were just not distributed. But I mean, the day he left, I mean, there was there was violence uh, in Maidan. I'm sure that your friend, most of the people were peaceful protests without question. Yeah. Hundred people died, as we know. And he there had were a sniper sitting on the right. top of right. the There's a lot the of question about who they were shooting at, maybe both people, but Yanukovych had agreed to with the, I think with the Germans and the French, the new elections. And uh, he was announcing that, and then uh, he fled violence, and the, uh, entering of government buildings, and the next day there was a, a vote to impeach him, but he had already left already. Yeah, that's so, uh, Yanukovych would say, and I think a lot of Russian-speaking Ukrainians, that that was a unconstitutional change of government because he was fairly elected. The OSCE said yes. so in 2010. Yes, I agree. So was that a, a revolution or a coup is what I'm asking? Now, I, I think and I believe the majority of Ukrainians think that was a revolution. He fled, so actually he left the position open yeah. and somebody has to fill in right. and they were normal elections with no violence yes. after the three months of his absence and there was a new president elected a new parliament elected right. do you know anything about american involvement in those events of february 2014 in shooting no not 
Germany should you know. I'm referring to the now very famous uh, conversation between Victoria Nuland, who's the Secretary of State, and Jeffrey Piat, who was the American ambassador, in which they're discussing who is going to be in the new government, way before there was a new government. Yanukovych was still the president, and he, they talked about Yatsenuk being the prime minister. Not Klitschko, they, uh, Nuland didn't want Klitschko. And they talked about uh, midwifing this change and that Joe Biden would have, a, the vice president, have a big role there. And he said, subsequently did have a big role in Ukraine as the representative of Obama in Ukraine. So there's a lot of questions raised that this was, uh, the U.S. had a hand in some way in changing the government, not through a new election that Yanukovych agreed to, but through what turned out to be violent means. What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Um, the the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here, um, especially the announcement of him as deputy prime minister. And, and you've seen some of my notes on the troubles in the marriage right now. So we're trying to get a read really fast on where he is on this stuff. But I think your argument to him, which you'll need to make, I think that's the next phone call we want to set up, is exactly the one you made to, to Yachts. And I, I'm glad you sort of put him on the spot on where he fits in this scenario. And I'm very glad he said what he said in response. Good. So uh, I don't think Cleach should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you think – what, in terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Book and his guys. And, you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. Um, I'm I, kinda, I, I, just, I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk. It's just not going to work. Yeah, no, it, I, think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay, good. Well, do you want us to try to set up a call with him as the next step? My understanding from that call, but you tell me, was that the big three were going into their own meeting and that Yats was going to offer in that context a, a three-way, you know, the three-plus-one conversation or three-plus-two with you. Is that not how you understood it? No, I think, I mean, that's what he proposed, but I think just knowing the dynamic that's been with them where um, Klitschko has been the top dog, he's going to take a while to show up for whatever meeting they've got, and he's probably talking to his guys at this point, so... I think you reaching out directly to him helps with the personality management among the three, and it, and it gives you also a chance to move fast on all this stuff and put us behind it, behind it before they all sit down and he, um, he explains why he doesn't like it. Okay, good. I'm happy. Why don't you reach out to him and see if he wants to talk before or after? Okay, will do. Thanks. Okay, I've now written – oh, one more wrinkle for you, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember if I told you this or if I only told Washington this, that when I talked to Jeff Feltman this morning, he had a new name for the UN guy, Robert Seri. Did I write yeah. you that this morning? Yeah, okay. I saw that. He, he's now gotten both Seri and Ban Ki-moon to agree that Seri could come in Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it and, you know, fuck the EU. No, exactly. And I think we've got to do something to make it stick together because you can be pretty sure that if it does if it does start to gain altitude, the Russians will be working behind the scenes to try to torpedo it. And again, the fact that this is out there right now, I'm still trying to figure out in my mind why Yanukovych that. But in the meantime, there's a party of regions faction meeting going on right now, and I'm sure there's a lively argument going on in that group at this point. But uh, anyway, we could uh, we could land jelly side up on this one if we move fast. So let me work on let me work on Klitschko, and if you can just keep, I, I think we want to try to get somebody with an international personality to um, come out here and help to midwife this thing. And then the other the other issue is some kind of outreach to Yanukovych, but we probably regroup on that tomorrow as we see how things start to fall into place. 
So on that piece, Jeff, uh, when I wrote the note, uh, Sullivan's come back to me, uh, VFR, saying you need Biden, and I said probably tomorrow for an attaboy and to get the deets to stick. So okay. Biden's willing. Well, I don't know about exact this uh, recording or exact yeah. this conversation, but what I what, uh, uh, can say that, yes, Yatsenyuk was uh, on the top of the intermediate government, but since the elections to the parliament, right. there was a new government uh, established, and Groisman was on the top of that right. government, so Yatsenyuk was just a transitional figure right. anyway. Right. So I believe Ukrainians were those who decided okay. who will be the government. What, what do you think the Russian motives are for their invasion? I believe the motives are very complex, but I don't know, and probably nobody knows exactly, who actually made the final decision except Putin. Because as far as I understand, and as far as the rumors come from, from the Kremlin, uh, even the, the, the wider circle of Putin people, they didn't know the war will start as a total war, mm -hmm. and it will be so brutal. Mm -hmm. Uh, it seems for me that it's not in Russian interest. Right. And I know for sure that people who before were Russian-oriented or, um, let's say, Russophiles, they, since now on, will be, I can say, forever against anything Russian. Even Russian-speaking Ukrainians that you might know? I believe they will choose another language for their children. Hmm. Well, let's go... Um, now, Putin made clear on that speech before the 21st that he started talking about Lenin having made a mistake to give uh, the, the Soviet republics the right to secede, etc. And there's no question that he had in his mind maybe someday taking back Nova Russia that Catherine the Great established and making it either independent or part of Russia. However, we go back to the events of February 2014. Had Yanukovych, who agreed with the Russian deal rather than the EU association agreement. This was really the spark, I think, that made, in my view, the Americans more intent to get rid of Yanukovych. Therefore, uh, by kicking him out that way and by the Donbass Russian speakers then resisting that, what they see as a coup, and then declaring their independence from Ukraine, not autonomy, as the Minsk Accords led. And Russia did not accept or recognize that independence. They did, of course, what happened in Crimea. That without that events of the February 24th, getting rid of Yanukovych, would Russia, uh, would Putin have ever had an opportunity to do what he's done now, including his statements that he's protecting the people of Donbass. There was a war launched against them. I'm sorry for saying that, yeah. but was in Georgia Yanukovych was in Georgia, Georgia? In Georgia. Was yeah. in Georgia president fleeing or whatever? Well, was in Georgia some particular violence in the capital? No. But the invasion happened anyway. Well, if you, if you look at the European Parliament, they did a study and they blamed Georgia for that. The European Parliament blamed Georgia for what happened in Abkhazia uh, and South Ossetia. I'm sorry to say that. I'm just but stating yeah, this fact. Don't you think there is a kind of discourse which I can call blame on the victim? Yeah. I believe Georgia was a victim, okay. as as same as I believe till today that Moldova was a victim right. of the events in Transnistria. So right. actually, you know that uh, no border is um, clear and clear cut. There is always ethnicity minority, language minority, religious minority, cultural minority, which is across the border. And it's only Stalin who was deporting people in multiple right. who made more or less uh, the borders which we are uh, um, creating homogeneous community. Right. But it could not stay forever. Right. And Ukraine is now more homogeneous than it was. Right. But it will be complex again. It was complex and it will be complex well, again. Back to Russia's motive. What do you think? Uh, why do you think Putin did it? And what do you think his end game might be here? Well, there are many explanations, and I think they are floating and changing from week to week. Because at the beginning, uh, there was an explanation that he just wanted to protect Russian-speaking population. Right. But the Russian-speaking population of Ukraine was very clear that they don't want him to come with tanks, bombs, shells, and uh, mm, missiles to protect them. And Odessa or, or Kharkiv, they are almost 100% Russian-speaking cities, which are now under big threat. And uh, I believe that uh, it is important to have a kind of inside civilian discussion about how will we 
live together and do we have a common purpose? And in my opinion and in the opinion of my generation and many generations after me in Ukraine, we have a common purpose and we want to be one country, even uh, so we are quite different. And uh, uh, under circumstances like like ours now, we uh, thought that probably, and in his speech on the night of uh, February 21, 2022, um, Putin clearly said that Ukraine does not exist, that Ukrainian language and culture does not exist, or if it even exists, it should not exist, and it is a failed state, and so on and so forth. So actually, he was trying to um, explain or to motivate his uh, his logic why Ukraine will cease to exist in a couple of next days. But Ukraine proved to be, and Ukraine proved to be functional state, because in my city, but even in the city of Kyiv, which was under siege, the, the, all, all the processes are going, health care is there, social security is there, senior citizens receive their pensions, we work and go to our works, and even the garbage is taken away every second right. day from my house. So everything well, is functioning. Well, the Russians say they never intended to take the cap to Kiev, that they, that they were not stalled there, that that was a diversion to pin down Ukrainian troops so that they could concentrate on Mariupol. What happened there? You weren't you're not in Kiev, but well, I have friends and yeah. I have relatives there. Okay. And probably you saw reports from Irpin, Bucha, Borodyanka, right. and many other places. And there will be more coming from Kherson, which is now yeah. occupied, and from Mariupol. I I don't know what actually has happened, but as much as I can reconstruct, yeah. this is the soldiers, the Russian soldiers we are told by their officers, they can do everything with civilians. And it depends on the capacity of your imagination. What will you do with other people if you are said that you can do anything? Right. Happens everything except cannibalism. So uh, I think you mentioned, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought I heard you mention something about statues to Stalin that are being erected in Russian-speaking Yes, here? or resurrected or erected in Russian-speaking. Since no, the invasion? No, 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 no. Oh, before that. Yes, I believe across Russia, the cult of Stalin oh, was... Oh, Russia, not in Ukraine. Not in Ukraine. Oh, okay. They were coming back year by year, and uh, yes, and uh, it's not me who will interpret that, but I know that they, we are even collecting those old statues which were destroyed somewhere else, and they were trying to resurrect them right. somewhere. Right. And we all know that, that there is uh, not one functioning museum devoted to Stalin in Russia. Right. And uh, uh, Putin himself has said that Stalin was an effective manager. Right. Now, I know that some of the nationalist, uh, even extreme groups in Ukraine get very small numbers of votes in parliament, 2% or something. That's true. Less However, than 1%. Less than 1%. However, you talked about the Stalin of the statue of Stalin. I need to ask you about the statues of Bandera in your city and elsewhere. In yeah, I believe that uh, the cult of Bandera was created by Stalin. It was like the negative result of his efforts. He wanted the Ukrainians to stop dream about independence. But he was so um, violent in, in crushing Ukrainian independent movement that Bandera, who actually was just one figure in this movement, became an icon of this movement because Stalin and Stalinists were uh, naming Ukrainian uh, uh, fighters for independence being Banderits and uh, um, supporting Bandera and uh, that was going from generation to generation to that extent that even inside Ukraine parts of Ukraine under Soviet rule thought that for example the western Ukraine is entirely Banderit and I have uh, been probably 16 years old girl when I first came out from the train on Kiev's train station that was the first time that I was called Galician and the first time in my life that I was called Banderit I never felt neither one nor second I was Ukrainian and yes. that was the fate in which I was raised and just who called, Ukrainian who called you that? who called you that? just people on the street because the train was coming from Lviv so, but when did Stalin do this? Because during the war, of course, 
the OUN, they worked first with the Nazis, yeah. then they wanted independence, and you, they you know, the probably, Nazis. You know the story better than me, but mm. in the interval period, there was no Ukrainian state as independent right. state. Part, the biggest part of Ukraine was inside the Soviet right. Union, it was Ukrainian Soviet Republic, but it was uh, ruled from the Moscow, not from Kharkiv. And another part, which is now integrated into Ukraine, was the part of the Polish state. But uh, it was so-called Eastern Galicia. And this Eastern Galicia was swallowed into Polish state uh, under the Treaty of 1922 at a very special um, mentioning that in 10 years there will be a referendum on the fate of this part of Poland because it's uh, comprised rather on national and religious minority, which was Ukrainian minority and Greek Catholic minority, which was not Catholic, but rather, I don't know, the, the, the blur of uh, uh, Orthodox and uh, Catholic Church. So 10 years passed, but Poles were not easy with um, the idea that this part could be just detached from that or autonomous from them. So Pilsudski, uh, who was on the top of Polish um, establishment at that time, he uh, waged a campaign which was called pacification campaign in order to stop Ukrainians from their movement of being independent. Right. And uh, this pacification had a very harmful result because those Ukrainians who were integrated into Polish political and social life stopped to contact and stopped to take part in the real politics and majority of young generation went underground. Organization of Ukrainian nationalists was terrorist and was underground. So it was not representing right. for the majority of Ukrainians of Western part. Right. It was a tiny fraction. But that tiny fraction thought of their fathers as losers yeah. because they were too mild. That's why mm -hmm. you probably compare that with Irish story. They were very militant and they wanted to make good <laughs> to their homeland which was under pressure and what was under siege as they thought. But you also have to know that Bandera was very young when he was already jailed and he spent I don't know, five to six years in Polish jail. Then he somehow fled when uh, the Poland was um, uh, attacked both from Nazi Germany and Soviet Union, and he hid it somewhere. And then he was, of course, important because he managed to split organization of Ukrainian nationalists into two fractions. Maybe, yeah. Yes, and then he was taken to jail by Nazis, and right. he spent quite a lot of time in the Second World War II sitting somewhere, maybe quite comfort comfortably, but in Sachsenhausen. So actually, his um, colleagues or his, um, I don't know, believers were those who were doing all kind of things, including nasty things. Mm -hmm. And I believe the most nasty thing was that part of them uh, have took part in... Um, um, how do you call it? Nazi. Helping police, uh, yes, yeah. helping uh, Nazi police when they were seizing Jews on Belarusian ground first and then on Ukrainian ground. But these were rather episodes. It was not something which was ruled by Bandera or, I don't well, know, but, but even he, approved by Bandera. He was involved in Baba Yar, for example. Is that... Bandera? Yeah. No. 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 We know other, uh, I, I am not um, the historian of that period, right. but there are good uh, studies of that. Um, I believe Rosolinsky Liebe is uh, writing about it and uh, Alexander Zaitsev in Ukraine, that uh, of course there were some um, colleagues of him who were uh, probably involved, so-called Bukovinian Kurin, but again, Bukovina, it was another country, it was Romania, and these guys were Ukrainians, but it not necessarily that we were Banderit, right. or at least that they were under command so, of Bandera. So you're saying Stalin used him to fight against the Nazis in the war? No, no, no. I say that Stalin made him in the icon yeah. of anti-Soviet Ukrainian nationalism. Right. Bandera was one of the few leaders, okay. they were m more than just Bandera. But yeah. Stalin, who was fighting all the, all the time against Bandera yeah. and looking at, uh, for, for Bandera to be caught, and actually I believe... Assassinated him in yeah, 1959 and, uh, in yeah, Munich. In yeah. Munich. Right. So yes, I believe that, Ban uh, that Stalin actually very much helped to, um, to put Bandera in this mental pedestal. I see. 
Well, he is there today, and how do you feel about the, the statues, the fact that he was made a hero of the Ukraine? Maybe yes. he isn't now, I can't find out yes. why they... I believe I that uh, I, I would never uh, like to somehow um, excuse myself before Russians now in this war, for example, that Bandera is standing here, because they don't excuse uh, um, for uh, Stalin standing somewhere else, yes? I believe there is this fight of uh, statues and the, the fight of extremes between us. But the people um, be, um, before which I would excuse and sometimes I accuse, ac excused are Poles, because of course for Poles, Bandera is a, a symbol of another very murky uh, episode in Ukrainian-Polish relationship, Volinian uh, massacre. And uh, nevertheless, again, Bandera was not there, and Bandera probably was not even knowing about there mm. in all details before it has unfolded. But there were those groups of Ukrainian nationalists who were taking advantage of a situation when Nazi already were departing and Soviets not yet yeah. arrived, they started to clean up as they thought uh, the future, I don't know, poor, ethnically poor Ukraine. Yeah. And of course, I'm shocked by that. And mainly all contemporary Ukrainians are sh in shock and grief about right. that. So you're troubled by this revival. Is it, forget about the Stalin revival, now, just as the image that it creates for Ukraine. Yeah. You're troubled by this, the, yes, the torchlight marches and all that. Yes, I am. But I know that in this war, Bandera will be resurrected again. Yeah. Because everything which irritates Russians now is good. I see. Now, Zelensky, um, I find him changing his mind every couple of minutes. I mean, he's given interviews to American television in which he said, I'm ready to talk to the Russians about their deal to about Donbass, about Crimea, and about neutrality in the Constitution, and then five minutes later he says, he, is he under his own power, or do you think he's under a lot of pressure from other forces, and what might those forces be? Is he really being able to speak his own mind now? Well, uh, since we have elected him, I believe there was quite a big face in him, because it was more than 70% of Ukrainians who actually voted him into the cabinet. And the war, the civil war, Donbass, isn't that? It's true, and yeah. yes, please, uh, like, revent and uh, remind yourself that Zelensky was doing very many important steps in the direction to, s to stop the war. Right. And he was serious about that. Mm -hmm. But as much as I understand, the negotiations stuck and as much as I uh, understand, Putin was not very much into, um, I don't know, finding a solution. As I understand this now in the reverse, uh, there were a lot of things uh, on the Russian side. They were demanding, knowing that Ukrainians will not be able to, compl uh, to implement that. Because very often yeah. they were asking, shoot your left leg, shoot your right leg. You mean that as some kind of a no? Yes, yes, because like uh, if you give uh, Donbass the total autonomy yes. and total uh, um, last say in your international politics, then you are trapped. Okay. How would they get the last say in the international politics? Because it was said in the Minsk agreement yes. that without approval from Donbass, we could not be the part of European Union. I see. Okay, so what... Did you agree when Poroshenko began uh, what he called anti-terrorist operation against Donbass? How did you feel at that time? Yes, I think that we all know now there were Russian soldiers with no insignia, yeah. which were coming from, from abroad and uh, they were bringing also a lot of weapons. So, uh, to be true, as a, as a poet, I could be metaphorical, but now I want to be very documentary. It was already hot war unfolding that time. Yes. But we didn't call it the war. We didn't call the war mm. the war for two reasons. First, because Russia would never admit that it is a war and it, it's at war with Ukraine. And secondly, because then we have to have a war, um, the martial law, and the whole um, community, the whole society should live according to the martial law. It means no elections, it yeah. means a kind of, uh, a kind of uh, possibility for dictatorship. 
and Ukrainians are not those who would like to live into dictatorship. Right. So in a way, Poroshenko had not, not very much options. So he opted for this yeah. anti-terrorist. And do you think the Americans had anything to do? How much influence do you think the United States government has in Ukraine? Well, it will be measured later. But I believe that Ukraine had to ask for some help because there was the, the incoming force which was many times bigger than we are. So we are the minor and Russia was the major. And it was um, in, in, intended to uh, do harm to many Ukrainian regions. The idea which was announced by Putin at that time that he will create Novorossiya. And Novorossiya, it means from Odessa up to Kharkiv. So that was his plan at that time. And Ukraine, when was that? it was 2014. Right. And Ukrainians actually stopped him uh, at the at the front line in Donbas, and f from our point of view, it was a kind of a kind but, of victory. But, wait a minute, they went without insignia. That's way different than what's happening now. Yes. Now sure. they may they may take Novorossi. Whatever happens after that is another question. Yes. That's so that true. when they, people talked about the Russian invasion, then uh, when you compare it to now, that was they were helping the people in Donbas. From those people's point of view, they voted for Yanukovych. They saw him leave through violence. They saw him being replaced, in their view, unconstitutionally. Yes. They declared independence, particularly eight days after the fire yeah, in Odessa, yeah, is not, when they declared yes. autonomy or, but or not in her son, not in Odessa, right, not in Mykolaiv. Right, Everybody right, was right. waiting for Russia to come. And waiting for no, no, they were not waiting were not for Russia waiting. to come. Well, that's right. They didn't. Uh, well, they were fighting in, in Odessa, and you know about yeah. the fire. I saw a very important slogan. There was a meeting in Odessa back in May 2014 when there was this talk about Novorossiya, and there were people, Russian-speaking people, standing in the middle of the old town of Odessa, and there was a young guy uh, carrying a slogan: "When Putin will come, we will not speak freely in Russian. We will be." Uh, we will be made keep silence in Russian. But I mean, uh, in that case, there was right sector at that time, C-14, and of course Azov, which is now part of the Ukrainian military. Now, you, you were troubled by Bandera. Does that trouble you too, that Azov is part of the state military under the interior ministry. Yes. But you know what? Uh, I was not tracing the fate of Azov so closely. Right. But what I know is that Azov itself has changed since 2014. Right. So the, a lot of things has happened uh, since it was announced it will be integrated into Ukrainian right. National Guard. And um, even those people who were most suspicious and who were doing research on uh, a far right in Ukraine recently, like a year ago, a year and a half ago, they, not that they changed their mind, but they re-approached the topic. Right. They researched for the second time with the battalion Azov, and they changed their opinion, they changed their estimation, how much far right the guys are. And, um, well, they've been trained by NATO, some NATO countries, including Canada, I understand. That's what I understand, I don't know if it's true. But so they still I, wear I, this, I, they still wear this. I don't think this, they would be yeah. trained somewhere in Canada if they would no, be far no, right. No, the Canadians inside there. Yeah, well, maybe that helped change them. But they're still wearing this wolf sangle thing, which troubles a lot of people. I mean, this is the SS. You know, we will know that later on, but people are now under siege for 78 days. Yeah. They are dying for their country. They are dying as Russian-speaking Ukrainians. Right. And I don't know, I, even, you know, if you tattoo something, yeah. it's not that easy then to just erase no, I'm not it. No, talking, talking about the patch on the uniform. No, no, there is no that wolf on the uniform anymore. Oh, I, I believe that. When? Uh, in Buka, for example, but during the massacre, the New York Times went in with Azov and they took pictures of these guys in Bucha, that the second in, day, Bucha, the town but, where the massacre took but place. But what Azov is doing in Bucha? Well, there. That's what the New York Times reported. That's interesting because Azov... With the picture of yeah, the wolf sign. As far as I understand, the real Azov in is Mariupol. now in Mariupol. That's right. They were there as well. I was surprised too. I thought they were so all So you know more Mariupol. than me. I don't know that. Okay. And I, I'm asking myself, are there also some fake Azovs also? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I want to ask you... Uh, this you may have no opinion on because I spoke about what's happening in the United States now. There's some troubling developments. The government has developed a disinformation governance board. There's two organizations that are going after our reporting. We're very small. We have 10,000 readers. 
and during the war now, uh, we went up to 40,000, but it's usually 10 to 20,000. So we don't have a lot of influence. And yet the, this PayPal system has shut us out. And this other organization that is headed by former CIA NSA director, top intelligence officials are putting pressure on us to reveal stuff about our, our, our funding and also demanding we make corrections to our reporting on Ukraine. And on another story too in Syria, but two of them on Ukraine. So it seems to me that this is uh, there's been censorship before uh, uh, in the West, and it seems like it's coming back in the U.S. What do you, as a member of Penn, you know, committed to freedom of speech? Do um, you may not know a lot about this, but would it, would it trouble you to know that the U.S. government is getting directly involved in what looks like policing thought and and writing? Well, I never experienced policing from the U.S., but I experienced policing from FSB. Yeah. And my father experienced policing from KGB, so yeah. I know something about this. Are you this. from Russia, your family? No, but you mean KGB, Soviet Union? Yeah, yeah, yes. Russia. So it's, it's really, um, for, for us, it's threatening that we know there are these um, uh, lists for people who, are, um, who have to be shot as soon yes. as Russian army was arrived. Yeah. We know about people tortured and decapitated. We know about Sentsov, who spent so many years in prison somewhere in Labentangi, yeah. uh, uh, over the, the, the polar circle. So we know that the censorship or some kind of um, a harsh influence on the opinion was uh, going from our Nosson neighbor, but inside yeah. Ukraine, we managed to keep quite a plurality. Right. Sometimes its plurality was working against us. I mean that the, the enemy is at your door, but you're still quarreling. It's like a big Italian family. You have more important issues to quarrel about. But at the same time, I cherish this because Ukrainians, I believe, are very much, much about freedom of expression and freedom as such. Yeah. We value that right. and we we ready to fight for, for that. It's important. So does it trouble you Zelensky sh shut all the television stations? Yes, it troubles me. And he shut down 11 political parties? That's troubling? Um, some of these parties, I believe, we are just puppets. Yeah. But some probably will a real opposition. That troubles me. Yeah. But I believe there will be new opposition. And what I know for sure, there will be no cult of Zelensky in Ukraine. And Zelensky definitely will not be Putin number one or Putin of Ukraine. No. I see. Well, let's hope that the conflict ends soon in some way. Uh, but I fear that it will go on a long time. Do you think Putin would have annexed Crimea without the uh, overthrow of Yanukovych in 2014? Yeah. Of course, we will have more uh, sources on that subject. But I will give you just one proof. There were medals uh, stamped in, um, in advance for the liberation of Crimea. And the date on these medals, which are in metal, is February 22, 2014. But the Russian uh, army actually approached Crimea only on the night uh, February 23, 24. So they have prepared that in advance, and they even knew the date before. 2014. 2014. But, but Yanukovych was overthrown on uh, which day? 20? On 23. They had made these medals already? Yes, but they, they were already giving them away on that Okay, day. that still doesn't really answer my question. Suppose they anticipated that there would be a violent But overthrow. how did they know the date? Well, I, I don't know. And I don't know either. So actually, there were probably different scenarios. Either you take the whole Ukraine, yes. and Yanukovych is not overthrown. But if there are suspicious things happening, then you just take Crimea. He's going to find a way. Well, if, he had, if Yanukovych had taken the Russian agreement and nothing happened to him, he wouldn't have taken Crimea. Because he would have been in more in the Russian yeah. camp, well, then, right? When you Excuse speak, yeah. I'd ask just ask one question. It's very much yeah. related. When was the referendum in Crimea? Was that earlier than the? Uh, it was uh, beginning of March, and I believe that the day when the treaty between Crimea and Russia, the Russian Federation, was signed, it was like March seven, when they adopted Crimea back into their proud family of uh, Russian Federation. Hmm. Yanukovych had remember? taken the Russian deal and there was no yeah. Do you remember rebellion? that Putin had the geopolitical project of Eurasian Union? Yes. And Ukraine had to become part of it. Right. And that was what Yanukovych wanted to do, right. but could not do because 
the people of Ukraine were opposing that. But the, his parliament, who led, voted in favor of it. Well, he but, had the majority in the parliament. Yeah, but we have um, we have uh, reasons to believe that uh, the M MPs were bribed to to vote like that. And the, this strong opposition on the street was like a direct democracy. People yeah. just uh, went into the street because they were so strongly opposing yeah. that. That's one way to put it. But the, the extremists had a big role to play on, in that Maidan, didn't they? From the start... People came from your city, as of, went there. Yes, but from the start, it was called Evra Maidan. It started uh, as early as November 21, even before Yanukovych went to Vilnius, where actually he refused to sign the treaty. And these were just students, and these students were violently uh, crushed, beaten, and uh, um, um, approached by the police. And when the students were beaten, the next day, the big crowd of people actually came to streets with slogans that yeah. you have beaten our children. Right. And then uh, he tried to back off the police, but it was too late then. Too late. Yeah. Uh, Irina, thank you very much for talking to us. I appreciate you. Thank you for me. asking. Okay. Okay. Yeah, um, whatever you feel like is the best thing to do with it, and good luck. Good luck. <laughs> thank you. Interesting. That was a bit weird. Nice. <laughs> so this was an American tourist here who was listening. You see? And he gave you money. That's amazing. American dollars. A <laughs> bunch of American she dollars. A, she got show us, show us. She got a donation. How much did you get? I don't know. Yeah. Let's let's see. He said a couple of dollars. Well. Wow. He said it's not much, but it was five, 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 two hundred dollars. You got a hundred dollars. <laughs> it's not me. I will donate it further. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for talking and thank you for asking.